New Jersey, 1999. It all started with the mail. A missing bank statement from his Vanguard Group Mutual Fund. December 98. Where was it? For the last three years, his niece had forwarded the annual statement to him like clockwork. That was their deal. But today, nothing. The postman had simply walked on by. His first reaction was confusion. Then, rage. No, something was definitely not right here. And worse, there was nothing he could do. He couldn't call his niece. He had to wait a few days just to use the telephone. Write her a letter? How long would that take? Maybe he'd make his nephew look into it for him. He wanted to know what happened to his bank statement, and he wanted to know now. He finally called his niece. Once. Twice. Left a message. No reply. Then he called his sister, Judith Sapsa. She told him something like, Yeah, it got lost. We can't find it, but, you know, as soon as we do, we'll send it right away. But she was a liar. She couldn't be trusted. She was always jealous of him, hateful. If he could get his hands on her, well, she'd find that letter real quick. This is how things went down. Their mother, Veronica Zorinsky, had died four years before and left nearly everything she had to him, her son, 59-year-old Robert Zorinsky. The 121000 Vanguard Mutual Fund account, which she'd established in his name, a plot of land in Clinton Township, a family home on Bower Street in Linden. And to Judith, she'd left a mere $30,000 and not a penny more. And as far as Zorinsky was concerned, that's all she deserved. He gave her until March, then called the Vanguard Group. The taxes were due on the house and he wanted answers. He loved that house. It was sacred to him, the only home he had ever known, the keeper of all his secrets. He'd never even listed it for rent or sale. He'd left it precisely the way it was, abandoned and unoccupied. He'd paid the taxes and upkeep right from his cell at Northern State Prison in Newark, where he held the infamous distinction of being the first person in New Jersey state history to be convicted of murder without a corpse. Zorinsky was not pleased. Vanguard Group Brass found an account balance of 8500 Over an 18-month period, from April 1998 through May 1999, someone had withdrawn $112,500, and it wasn't Zorinsky who had done the withdrawing. According to Tony Esposito, a public relations spokesman and inspector for the U.S. Postal Service. Initially, this guy calls up and says, I'm a victim of identity theft. An inspector starts to take down the information, not knowing who Robert Zorinsky was. How can we get in touch with you? He, Zorinsky, says, Well, I'm serving 98 years in prison. A veteran inspector was put on the case, Joseph Jakubiak. We had to treat the complaint whether he was in prison or not said Jakubiak. And with all cases like this, you follow the paper trail. Jakubiak contacted the Vanguard group, who sent him the cancelled checks and information on where they were cashed. Everything pointed to Acme check cashing on Route 27 in Rahway. The facility was equipped with Regiscope, a camera that captures snapshots of everyone who cashes a check. There on film was the man posing as Robert Zorinsky. The picture looked like something was wrong with his eye. And speaking to the people at Acme, they said it looked like he'd had cataract surgery. Jakubiak contacted area eye surgeons and the man was identified. His name was Peter Sapsa, Zorinsky's brother-in-law, Judith's husband. Jakubiak got an arrest warrant for Peter Sapsa, while Judith Sapsa was also brought in, on suspicion of embezzlement charges. Peter Sapsa caved under grilling by postal authorities. He confessed to everything. He'd gone down to see his daughter in Matawan and pinched Zorinsky's mutual fund checkbook. He started filling in the zeros, forged his brother-in-law's name. Then he drove over to that storefront check-cashing joint with the bulletproof windows. He needed money badly. He was sick. A heart transplant was penciled in on some future calendar. The disability he collected from his job as a supermarket clerk barely paid his health premium. His wife was a diabetic. She'd never worked. The medical bills were mounting. It was Judith Sapsa who had rationalized, remembering something her mother had said. If you ever need money, 
your brother will help you. Bob, as she referred to him, had already served 25 years for the 1969 murder of 17-year-old Rosemary Calendriello of Atlantic Highlands, whose body had never been found. Judith Sapsa, who hadn't visited her brother in prison in more than 10 years, went to him and asked for his help. He declined. The rest was on the crime blotter. Peter Sapsa was charged with tampering, while Judith Sapsa remained under investigation. It was wire fraud, four times over. Federal theft charges were pending. Husband and wife were staring at five years in prison without parole. Then Jakubiak got a call from Judith Sapsa's attorney, A. Kenneth Wiener of East Brunswick. He, Wiener, said, Hey, Joey, I have an unbelievable story for you, said Jakubiak. I can't talk to you on the phone about it, but it may help my client. Why don't we sit down and talk? Judith Sapsa had decided it was time to cooperate, time to come clean. She told Wiener that she wanted a deal, an exchange, leniency, for information. There were things she knew, things she could tell them about her brother. And this is what she told. Her brother and her now 61-year-old cousin, Theodore Schiffer, had killed a patrolman in Rahway, New Jersey, Charles Bernoski. Bernoski, 30, and a married father of five with a sixth child on the way, had been shot to death while investigating a burglary at the Miller Pontiac Cadillac dealership on St. George Avenue in Rahway on November 28, 1958. No charges had ever been filed. According to the Spectator leader, Sapsa reportedly said, on the night of the murder, when she was 16 years old, Zorinsky and Schiffer came to the family's house on Bowers Street in Linden with an Aunt Irene. Zorinsky was shot in the hip and Schiffer was shot in the chest. Zorinsky said a police officer had shot Schiffer, and he had gotten angry and shot the police officer. She then watched as her mother, Veronica Zorinsky, removed the bullets from Zorinsky and Schiffer under the light of one kitchen lamp using tongue depressors and tweezers and no medication. Veronica Zorinsky then swore the family to secrecy. No one ever said anything again in the family about the surgery, said Wiener, according to the spectator leader. The day after it happened, Judy remembers her father reading in the paper that the cop died. He regurgitated, threw up. That was it. Zorinsky and Schiffer were then sent to Carbondale, Pennsylvania, until the heat died down. Zorinsky responded to the accusation with a letter to Jakubiak, calling his sister and brother-in-law thieves and liars. He felt the story had been concocted in an attempt to avoid criminal prosecution for their mail fraud crimes. Judith Sapsa stuck to her tale. She said she had held on to the family secret for 40 years because she feared for her life. She was petrified of her brother, who still cast a murderous shadow from behind prison walls. Zorinsky had been a bad seed right from the beginning. Murder had it that he'd painted swastikas on Jewish tombstones. Neighbors remembered him killing birds and torturing animals. He, Zorinsky, was a sadistic individual, Jakubiak said. He talked to me about his childhood, how he started killing animals, and at one point in the conversation, he actually regressed to a 10 or 11-year-old child. He actually started talking like an 11-year-old child. He was off the wall. Zorinsky moved on to robbing houses and committing petty crimes. He was sent to reform school and put under psychiatric care. He took up weight training and at 225 pounds built himself into a cross between Dick Butkus and the Fawns. His profile reads, Cold, delusional, domineering, Nazi, psychopath, paranoid schizophrenic. When you look at his file, he was right up there as one of the worst I'd seen in Union County, said Frank Pfeiffer, a detective for the Union County Prosecutor's Office. Yet the flip side of Zorinsky's profile paints a completely different picture. Intelligent, self-educated, maniacal genius, egomaniac, arrogant, good to his mother. According to Pfeiffer, she, Judith Sapsa, and their mother always protected him. Bob could do no wrong. We couldn't do things that would upset Bob. Everything was about Bob. Judith Sapsa said that while they were growing up, Zorinsky would frequently assault both her and their father. Although their mother, Veronica Zorinsky, an occasional accomplice, always made sure that her teenage son avoided punching his sister in the face. Their mother looked the other way when the abuse turned sexual. Zorinsky took on an alter ego, Lieutenant Schaefer. According to Gabriel H. Gluck in the Star Ledger, 
He once told investigators that he was organizing an American Republic army that would take over New Jersey and he would be king. Angry over being jilted by an early girlfriend, he desecrated more than 1,500 headstones in Rosedale Memorial Park Cemetery, then set fire to the city's five lumber yards. He told me about the cemetery, Jakubiak said. He told me, his words, he probably knocked down 500 headstones, and for two or three days afterwards, he couldn't move his arms. He pleaded insanity and was given probation. His father put him to work as a delivery man in the family produce business, and he settled into a solitary life. He eventually married, and his wife came to live with them in the family home, and together they had a son. The son died two years later, complications from asthma. Then, Rosemary Calendriello disappeared. Flashback, 1969. A harrowing final image. Calendriello being driven out of town in a beat-up black-and-white Ford Galaxy convertible. She holds her glasses in her hands and leans away from the driver, against the passenger side door. Zorinsky is behind the wheel. Sam Guzzi, retired police chief of Atlantic Highlands, and the lead detective who investigated Calendriello's disappearance, recounted the case in a lengthy TV interview with Court TV's Crime Library. Said Guzzi, I'll take this one to my grave. The details. Calendriello goes to the store at 6.15 p.m. to buy ice cream pops and milk. She never returns. Two hours later, her mother reports her missing. The next morning, Guzzi, assigned to the case, interviews four boys. They lived on the same block as Calendriello, had seen her the night before. It was end of day. They'd been cruising Center Avenue and had stopped in the parking lot of the local bowling alley. They saw Calendriello in the ragtop, seated beside a husky guy with a goatee and pork chop sideburns. He was in his late twenties. They couldn't understand why she was in this car, said Guzzi. They knew her. They knew she didn't have any boyfriends. They knew she was a homebody. They tailed them for three blocks, then got bored and turned around. The story ran in the local papers. A woman came forward and said that someone had recently tried to pick up her daughter and her friends, all between the ages of 11 and 13. He'd come back on three separate occasions, had offered the girls wine. One of the girls took a stick and wrote the car's license plate number in the sand, CGI 109. Investigators ran the plates, tracked the vehicle to Linden. It was registered under Julius Sarinsky, Robert's father. The car matched the description. We made out a warrant for contributing to the delinquency of a minor, Guzzi said. That was all we could do. Rosemary was still considered a missing person. Linden police observed Sarinsky washing out the trunk of his car with a sponge and pail. The car was a junkyard dog, Guzzi said. When we asked him why he was cleaning it, he said, Oh, I had some stuff in there. Veronica Zorinsky was angry the police would even think her son would be involved with missing girls. She was different, Guzzi said. I'll tell you that much. And the father was like a vegetable. The mother totally dominated that family. Detectives checked the car and found no window or door handles on the passenger side. Guzzi theorized he opened the car door from the inside, then hid the handles under the seat so that his victims were trapped in the car. One of Rosemary's hair clips was found on the floor of the car. In the back seat was a pair of panties that Rosemary's mother thought belonged to her daughter. Although Zorinsky's wife would later testify that the panties were hers and that she was with her husband on the night of Calendriello's disappearance, Guzzi claimed Zorinsky's wife was scared to death of him. Investigators also found a blood-stained hair on the end of a ball-peen hammer. Zorinsky was arrested and his car impounded. He was put in jail where guards were warned not to let him shave before he could be brought before a police lineup. But Zorinsky borrowed hair removal cream from a fellow inmate and presented himself clean of his trademark sideburns and goatee. Still, he was identified by the four boys. Another inmate who was in jail for passing bad checks was put into the same cell as Zorinsky. We told him to find out what he could, said Guzzi. Zorinsky admitted the truth but prosecutors refused to try him for murder because there was no body. He, Zorinsky, said, I killed a girl, but the cops will never find her, said Guzzi, and all we had him for was contributing to the delinquency of a minor with the girls he had offered the wine. He was released on bail. Prosecutors almost immediately started receiving anonymous death threats. Zorinsky was found guilty, but appealed his case, which was later overturned. According to the Star-Ledger, 
the judge in the case interrupted the trial to declare an acquittal, saying the state had not proved its case. I'm convinced the defendant stands before the court right now as a nucleus of many evils, Judge George Gray declared. I feel that something should be done with this man. However, we live in a government of law and not of men. Sarinsky was a free man. I watched out for him all the time, Guzzi said. Whenever there was a crime, I'd say, check Sarinsky. He's out there. Cut to five years later. Two bodies are dumped near a swamp in Manalapan. Joanne Delardo, 15, and Donna Carlucci, 14, both from the colonial section of Woodbridge Township, were found dead, each of them strangled with an electrical cord. I said, here we go again, Guzzi said. Two years prior, utilizing the most recent systems of identification, FBI agents linked the hair found on Zorinsky's ball-peen hammer not to Calendriello, but to Linda Balabano, 17, of Union Township, whose body had been found under the docks of a Hess refinery on the Raritan River in Port Reading, Middlesex County, four months before Calendriello disappeared. Balabano, whose body had been weighted down by an eight-foot-long tire chain, had also been strangled with an electrical cord. Middlesex County agencies refused to prosecute. He, Zerinsky, killed the Balabano girl just as sure as I'm talking to you. But the prosecutors didn't feel they had enough, said Guzzi. I was positive he killed her, plus the two other girls. Guzzi said, thank God for Jack Mullaney. John T. Mullaney was the assistant Monmouth County prosecutor before retiring in 1978 to start his own practice in Eatontown. He perused the Zerinsky file and gave Guzzi a call. Mullaney thought we could go to trial on the Calendriello case just on circumstantial evidence, Guzzi said. I said, I've been saying that for five years. Armed with a search warrant and an indictment for murder, police raided the Zerinsky home when they found, among other items, a black portable transistor radio belonging to Lyndon Balabano with the serial numbers scratched away. According to the Star-Ledger, Middlesex County authorities didn't think they had enough evidence to bring Zerinsky to trial for Balabano's murder, but Monmouth County authorities were willing to gamble on the Calendriello case. I stuck my head out, Mullaney said, according to the Star-Ledger. I just thought there were too many dead young females, too many bodies. Mullaney tried Zerinsky in Monmouth County for the murder of Calendriello, and this time he was found guilty. Flash forward, 1999. Because of Judith Sapsa's allegations, Jakubiak called the Union County Prosecutor's Office. Judith remembered things from that night very clearly. What she was eating, when they came in, where they were bleeding, said Jakubiak. Once I heard the details, I thought, this could be factual. That's when Detective Pfeiffer was brought down to the case. I knew who Zerinsky was, Pfeiffer said in an interview with Court TV's Crime Library. I was part of a team created in the early 90s to investigate cold cases, and we came across a set of latent fingerprints in the Bernoski case on a can of Prestone antifreeze that had never been identified. The team had run nearly 700 sets of fingerprints and asked for the public's help in solving the crime, but to no avail. Zerinsky had initially been a suspect in the case. He'd been brought into custody after being caught with a 32 caliber handgun belonging to a friend's father a lieutenant on the Linden police force. Zerinsky had intimidated the friend into stealing the gun for him. But the ballistics test proved negative on the gun, and Zerinsky's fingerprints didn't match the set that was found at the crime scene. Questioned by police about the Bernoski killing, Zerinsky replied, I would never shoot a cop. He was subsequently released. Forty-one years later, with Zerinsky now safely behind bars for another crime, Pfeiffer's goal was to find Schiffer. According to the New York Times, law enforcement officials initially looked for Mr. Schiffer in Florida before tracking him to Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania through his motor vehicle records. Pfeiffer and Captain William White of the Rahway Police Department drove out to Peckville, Pennsylvania to question Schiffer, a retired carpet installer who lived alone in a high-rise apartment building. They staked out his car, which had Florida tags, until Schiffer appeared at approximately 5 a.m., the two investigators approached and asked if they could talk to him about Robert Zerinsky. He denied having any involvement in the case, emphatically. Schiffer couldn't understand how his cousin, Judith Sapsa, could implicate him. He said there was no animosity between them. He wanted to know why, Pfeiffer recalled. I think the Zerinsky mystique carried over in that interview. His tentacles carried that far. 
The investigators got a court record to take Schiffer's fingerprints because they weren't on file. That's when the identification was made, said Pfeiffer. It was a home run. A Schiffer fingerprint matched the one on the can of antifreeze at the crime scene. The only crime that Ted Schiffer ever committed was this murder, said Pfeiffer. He had kept himself clean. His fingerprints were never in the FBI's national databank. He only screwed up this one time. According to the New York Times, the police also found a scar on Mr. Schiffer's chest where Ms. Sapsa said the bullet had been removed. Police in Peckville immediately arrested Schiffer as a suspect in Bernowski's killing, charging him with first-degree murder and burglary. Brought before the Lackawanna County Court in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Schiffer refused to waive his right to an extradition hearing. New Jersey Governor Christy Whitman issued and signed an extradition warrant that was then forwarded to Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge. A hearing was scheduled at the Lackawanna County Courthouse, where prosecutors needed to prove that Schiffer had been in New Jersey at the time of the crime and was, indeed, a fugitive. Two months later, Schiffer was shipped to the Union County Jail in New Jersey, where he was held in contempt of court for declining to provide information to the grand jury. His bail was set at $1 million. Meanwhile, police and investigators from eight law enforcement agencies descended upon the three-story stone house at the corner of 403 Bower Street in Linden. Armed with drills, saws, crowbars, hammers, pickaxes, and metal detectors, they frantically searched the house for any evidence that would link Sarinsky to the fatal shooting of Bernowski and the murders of the four teenage girls. The family home, vacant since 1995, was surrounded by unkempt bushes and tall evergreen trees which Zerinsky had planted himself in an attempt to conceal the house from the outside world. A five-foot-high, unfinished wall of stones bordered the east side of the home's dirt yard like a site-specific sculpture that had run out of funding. Neighborhood kids referred to the place as haunted. It was a rite of passage during the late 60s and early 70s to ring the doorbell and run, a dare fueled by rumors that the man who lived there was a mass murderer. It turned out, the rumors were true. Union County Police Lieutenant Michael Vina, who dealt with the media search at the site, actually grew up on Bower Street, a half a block away from Zerinsky. He remembered him as being strange. My father warned us about him, said Vena. They lived in the Munster's house. It was a spook house, the place you avoided on Halloween for trick-or-treating. You'd walk on the other side of the street. Once in a while, you'd see the mother out in the yard. She was like an old witch, like if she looked at you, you turned to stone. It was a house to be avoided. The home had been searched several times over the years, but those searches had been restricted to strictly surface items. This time, investigators torn to the rafters, ripped open and x-rayed walls and floorboards. Judah Sapsa was brought back to the house on three days of the search, the house she had grown up in and had left for good in 1962. Accompanied by her attorney, she was ushered into the side entrance and remained in the kitchen, where she recalled the fateful night of November 28, 1958. She pointed out where the table was that the surgery took place, said Pfeiffer. She was very emotional. She felt horrible for having lived with this all her life. She thought she should have come forward a long time ago. Thirty minutes later, she broke down in tears and had to be assisted from the scene. The search continued for three more days. Police hauled out of the house boxes of new evidence, including several pieces of jewelry. According to the New York Times, authorities showed the jewelry to Mr. Zerinsky's sister, who told investigators she did not recognize the items. One earring reportedly belonged to Anne Logan, a 19-year-old Seton Hall college student whose body was found in a wooded lot on East End Avenue in Roselle on September 18, 1973. Logan had been strangled and had non-consensual sex. The case had never been solved. Zerinsky was now a suspect in not only Bernowski's death, but in the deaths of Linda Balabanow, Joanne Delardo, Donna Carlucci, and Anne Logan. A prison spokesman announced that Zerinsky had requested and received a transfer from Medium Security Northern State Prison in Newark to the Maximum Security New Jersey State Prison in Trenton. Authorities claimed that because of the publicity, inmates were coming down hard on Zerinsky. Judith Sapsa's lawyer thought otherwise. According to the Star-Ledger, Sapsa's attorneys said prison officials made the move not because Zerinsky was afraid of other inmates, 
but because Sapsa and her husband, Peter, feared that Zerinsky could break out of the medium security prison and harm them. Both theories would later prove far from the truth. A source for Court TV's crime library revealed the real reasons behind Zerinsky's transfer. It turns out that Judah Sapsa's son had become a corrections officer, and he was assigned Zerinsky's cell. Nobody knew. How could they? His last name was Sapsa. The prisoner's last name was Zerinsky. This was the nephew and the uncle. Zerinsky was furious that they transferred him and not his nephew. He'd been there for 25 years. He was comfortable. Zerinsky's moves spurred the Sapsas to keep talking. Peter Sapsa, Judith's husband, told this tale. Summer, 1969. Zerinsky knocks on their door at three in the morning, asks for a ride to Hunterton County, an hour northwest of Linden. He puts in the trunk of Peter Sapsa's car a pick, shovel, and gunny sack. They stop at a remote area in Readington Township. Zerinsky then takes the burlap bag and disappears into the woods. Had he gone there to bury Rosemary Calendriello? Guzzi thought the story didn't seem plausible and was filled with holes. Pfeiffer added, we weren't sure if he was being totally truthful. Peter's memory was not that clear. It was somewhat cloudy, and he had some health issues too. We were never able to pinpoint where Rosemary's body may have been buried. Judith Sapsa now claimed that her brother may have been involved in the murders of up to ten area girls. She tried to connect her brother to the death of Linda Balabano. According to Guzzi, Judith Sapsa said her brother had been after her for a while. Judith Sapsa told police a story about visiting a beauty salon prior to a family wedding. Her brother had given her a ride to the shop, which was located in the Roselle Shopping Centre, across the street from where Balabano worked as a clerk in soap and drugs. As reported in the Star Ledger, Wiener said, she knows her brother was supposed to come back and pick her up, but he never did. He never showed at the wedding either. Judith Sapsa said shortly thereafter her brother gave her mother a radio with the serial numbers scratched away. The only problem was Judith Sapsa's dates didn't line up. Balabano disappeared two days before their family wedding. The investigation continued. Police searched a thrift shop called Just About Anything on St. George Avenue in Linden. The owner had bought the contents of the Zerinsky home in 1996 for $800. He had been phoned by the Sapsas, who intimated that the house had been listed on the marketplace and was about to be sold. According to the New York Times, the owner of the store said authorities were looking for a pair of handcuffs and a 22 caliber handgun that had belonged to Mr. Zerinsky. They found neither. Faced with another dead end, investigators decided to narrow their focus on the murder of Charles Bernowski. Schiffer copped a plea. He was an old man looking at some serious time, said Schiffer's co-counsel, Hassan Abdella of Elizabeth, in an interview with Court TV's Crime Library. He was very frail, very nervous. The years had really aged him. You could tell that he was still intimidated by Zerinsky. Schiffer was staring at 15 years for felony murder, but talked it down to seven, out in three on good behavior, and all served in the Lackawanna County Prison in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which was closer to his family in Peckville. He also took the investigators on a tour of the crime scene. Schiffer's memory was pretty good, said Pfeiffer. Believe it or not, a lot of stuff at the car dealership was still intact after all these years. We could even see in one of the trees the place where they had dug out bullets. The events, chronologically. Schiffer and his family had been visiting Linden for the Thanksgiving holiday. He and Zerinsky had gone for a drive in a 1951 Ford convertible. Zerinsky shows Schiffer a gun and suggests that they rob the Miller Pontiac Cadillac dealership for parts and cash. Schiffer was reluctant to comply, but was scared of his younger cousin, who had once thrown him down a flight of stairs. Zerinsky bullied him into the deed. Bernowski, at the time, had been working his bead along St. George Avenue, shaking door handles, peering into windows. He walked in on the attempted burglary and traded bullets with Zerinsky, emptying his revolver. A wounded Bernowski then staggered to a house two doors down where he crawled into the kitchen and died. Schiffer and Zerinsky, now bleeding from gunshot wounds, escaped back to their car, which was parked a few blocks away off West Milton Avenue. They headed towards Linden and cut through Rahway Park, where they dumped the gun into the Jackson Falls section of the Rahway River. Divers would later search the river with metal detectors, 
and although they found a gun, ballistic tests proved negative. It would be two years before Schiffer and Zerinsky would cross paths again. Schiffer had just gotten married and Zerinsky threatened him, told him not to tell his new wife, or else. Peter Sapsa, meanwhile, pleaded guilty to one count of federal mail fraud for bilking Zerinsky's trust fund. He faced five years in prison. Standing in front of U.S. District Court Judge Ann E. Thompson, Sapsa, as reported by Robert Croakley in The Spectator Leader, promised to help build a possible case against Zerinsky for the murder of the Rahway police officer Charles Bernowski and the unsolved disappearances of several young women from the late 60s to the mid-1970s. Judith Sapsa was not charged. Zerinsky was next in line. First-degree murder and felony murder charges were filed against him on December 9th and the death of Charles Bernowski. He was looking at a life sentence, plus the 98 years he was already serving. Bail was set at $1 million. He was shipped from Trenton State Prison to the Union County Jail in Elizabeth, where he was arraigned before Superior Court Judge John Triarcy and formally charged. He pleaded not guilty to all charges. His attorney, Joseph Benedict of New Brunswick, filed several motions with Triarcy, including one that claimed Zerinsky could not be tried for murder that took place 42 years before because the statute of limitations had expired five years after the crime. As reported by Marianne Spoto of the Star-Ledger, Benedict also asked Triarcy to move the trial to another county or to bring in jurors from outside Union County because of all the publicity surrounding the case. He requested a gag order to bar all attorneys, lawyers for witnesses, potential witnesses, Zerinsky's and Bernowski's family members and former prosecutors from commenting on the case. And he also asked the judge to exclude from Zerinsky's trial any evidence about his previous convictions according to the Star-Ledger. Triarcy refused to dismiss murder charges against Zerinsky, nor would he have the case moved to another county. Benedict did receive a gag order, though, and Triarcy agreed to impose limits on allegations against Zerinsky. Triarcy then promptly removed himself from the bench after discovering that his son had worked for a short time on the case as a summer intern with the Union County Prosecutor's Office. The case was reassigned to Judge Walter Barisanek. Zerinsky had interviewed attorneys for close to four months before Benedict decided to take the case. It was going to be a notorious case, and my client was not liked by anyone who knew anything about the case or him, said Benedict in an interview on Court TV's Crime Library. I had some personal reservations in representing him. I represent a lot of police officers. They're a big part of my practice. Some of them have become friends over the years. And I asked them, do you have any problem with me taking this case? And none of them did. That was my only issue with the case, that my friends or clients might be bothered. But this is what I do, so... There was also the issue of money. Benedict insisted that he get paid up front, and Zerinsky sold the family home to help pay legal fees. During four days of pretrial hearings, Benedict again argued that the passage of time was harmful to Zerinsky's case making it nearly impossible for him to mount a fair defense. Key investigators had died. Evidence had been lost or destroyed. Assistant County Prosecutor William Colano sought to use photographs of Schiffer's fingerprints left on a can of antifreeze, plus another shot of a screwdriver used to pry open the dealership's back door. The actual can of antifreeze and screwdriver had disappeared. Barisonek ruled in favor of the prosecution, but Benedict was undeterred. He asked that allegations by Schiffer and Judith Sapsa against Zerinsky be severely limited due to their prejudicial nature. Colano argued that the allegations were necessary to understand why Schiffer and Judith Sapsa had waited for more than 40 years to come forward with the truth. This time it was Benedict who got the nod from Berisonek. They decided that the following would not be heard. Zerinsky's past convictions for burglary. His threats on Schiffer's life the non-consensual sex against Judith Sapsa. Only the physical assaults on Judith Sapsa would be considered admissible. According to the Star-Ledger, Barisonek also refused to allow a jury to hear testimony from FBI Special Agent Daniel Garibrand, who interviewed Zerinsky on August 19, 1999, five days after his cousin was charged in Bernowski's murder. Garibrand and Zerinsky claimed to have knowledge about unsolved murders committed by and with other individuals but refused to disclose any information unless he was placed in a witness protection program and relocated to a military base or government reservation. Chikubiak, who interviewed Zerinsky at length several times, 
recalled the discussions. We talked to him at length several times. He, Zerinsky, was going to give me the body of Rosemary Calendriello in exchange for a deal. He wanted to go to a federal prison because, as he stated, he was getting old and he couldn't defend himself in jail anymore. He didn't want to stay in a big prison. He wanted to go somewhere he could plant a garden. That's what we were working on when he told me that he had killed approximately ten people. What I told him was, show me some good faith. You've killed these people, but the first thing I want is Rosemary's body. This way, I know you're being truthful, Jakubiak said. He never did. Borisonek was presented with a pool of close to 200 potential jurors, more than four times the normal amount for a criminal trial. The day we were picking a jury, I saw a lead article in one of the papers. My reaction was there's no hope in winning this case, because if any juror or any family member of a juror saw that article and talked about it, there was no way they couldn't find him, Zerinsky, guilty. It listed all the things he had been charged with and was alleged to have done. In one of his trials from the 70s, his lawyer asked him to write them down so that he could be prepared for it if they were to come up. Zerinsky did that and kept a carbon copy, and when his house was searched, they found the copy and it was 25 pages long. Borisonek took a single day to select the 12-member jury, plus four alternates. The case was ready for trial. The prosecution and defense presented their opening statements. Kalana walked the jury through the tragic events of November 28, 1958, a night that climaxed when Zerinsky shot Bernowski twice in the chest and once in the face. Benedict claimed that Zerinsky had been falsely charged and that Schiffer and Judith Sapsa, as reported in the Spectator Leader, were liars, cheats, and a murderer. Benedict told the jury that Sapsa and Schiffer were caught and were making deals with the prosecution. Sapsa knew about Zerinsky's scar and Benedict contended that Schiffer was given a script of Sapsa's statements in order to properly implicate Zerinsky. Sapsa and Schiffer had credibility issues, Benedict said. I told the jury that they would have difficulty believing either of these people, and if they did believe them beyond a reasonable doubt, they should find him guilty. Zerinsky was upset with me for putting all of our eggs in one basket, but I thought that was our best chance of succeeding. I set the bar and said, Now try to cross it. A group of witnesses were paraded onto the stand, starting with Elizabeth Bernowski. She identified her husband's uniform, stated that when he went to work, it didn't have bullet holes. It was heart-wrenching, Benedict said. It was very effective by the prosecutor to do that because it was pretty moving stuff. I was really impressed with her. She treated me with the utmost courtesy during the course of the trial. Her family had great dignity. She was obviously a strong woman to raise the family the way that she did. Benedict declined cross-examination. But Schiffer, he attacked. I asked Schiffer if he was a yes-man, Benedict said. He said no. Then I went through his original statement and found 27 yes answers in a row. So basically his statement was saying, yes, yes, yes. Benedict found four specific areas in the statement that were inconsistent with his yes answers i.e. Schiffer initially stated that he had been shot in the lower left side, not the chest. Judith Sapsa was a completely different story. She was a hostile witness, very good for the prosecution. I had a tough time developing any inconsistencies, but then Judith Sapsa faltered. The issue arose about her son who worked as a prison guard, Benedict said. It ended up that he worked at the same facility as Zerinsky. You're not supposed to work at the same facility if you have a relative there. The son claimed that he never said anything because he didn't want anyone to know that he was related to Zerinsky. And she, Judith Sapsa, outright lied about it. She denied that her son knew about Zerinsky. She was trying to protect him. We just happened to catch her in a lie and that was the first part of my strategy. You could not believe these people to convict someone beyond a reasonable doubt. Zerinsky in court listens to testimony. Then Zerinsky himself took the stand. I didn't want him to testify, but he insisted, said Benedict. He said the reason he was found guilty in his other case, Calandriello, was because he never got to take the stand. He blamed it on taking his lawyer's advice. Zerinsky had over the years fancied himself a jailhouse lawyer. He, Zerinsky, was one of the brightest clients I ever had, said Benedict. He knows the law. 
I had to do my homework before I had a meeting with him. I didn't want to be showed up. He'd asked me about how such and such a case applied. We had a lot of discussions about the legal issues in the case. Let me tell you how bright he is. During one of the pretrial hearings, a detective was testifying and we both noticed that he had said something that was inconsistent with his grand jury testimony. Now I pull out the grand jury testimony and Zorinsky whispers in my ear, It's on page 76, line 8. And sure enough, I go to page 76, and there's what I'm looking for. Zorinsky took the stand and steadfastly maintained his innocence. He claimed that he had gone to a movie on the night in question, but that all those who could corroborate his story had died. The prosecutor couldn't disprove his story either. The trial's most debated issue involved the scar on Zorinsky's back. The ultimate issue, though, was whether the forensic evidence supported the state's case, said Benedict. Zorinsky originally told investigators that an ex-girlfriend stabbed him with a pocket knife on the 4th of July weekend, 1958. Colano presented the chief medical examiner from Union County, who testified that photographs and x-rays of Zorinsky showed specks of metal fragments, possibly from an old bullet wound. Benedict countered by putting a forensic pathologist on the stand, who refuted the evidence. The Star-Ledger reported that the pathologist stated the scar was more consistent with a stabbing than with a gunshot wound and that the specks were flaws in the film. The state's experts went too far, said Benedict. They testified to something that they shouldn't have. If they were to have simply said, hey, it looks like a bullet wound to me, and sometimes they don't leave shrapnel, my expert would have agreed with that. The trial went on for six days. Benedict's closing statements echoed a familiar theme. According to the Star-Ledger, Schiffer and Judith Sapsa had lied in order to win easier treatment from authorities in their own criminal cases. Colano suggested the defense wants it both ways, saying that Benedict accepts Sapsa's claims about Schiffer but not about Zerinsky. A jury of nine women and six men deliberated for two days. I've never seen a jury deliver a verdict like this, said Benedict. The men were visibly angry and the women were crying. Zerinsky was acquitted. According to Robert Hanley in the New York Times, afterwards, the jury foreman was quoted as saying that several jurors wanted to convict Mr. Zerinsky, but that the evidence did not establish his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. A civil suit was filed by Elizabeth Bernoski. As reported by Sherry Song in the National Law Journal, the widow of a New Jersey police officer slain 45 years ago is going after the man once accused of killing him in a civil wrongful death and survivorship action for damages in excess of $1 million in Bernoski v. Zerinsky. Elizabeth Bernoski claimed not to care about Zerinsky's money. All she wanted was the truth. Judith Lucas, reporting in the Star-Ledger, wrote, Bernoski is hoping Zerinsky will be held responsible in civil court, where the threshold is lower. In civil trials, jurors base guilt on the weight or preponderance of evidence, not beyond a reasonable doubt, as in criminal cases. Kenneth Javerbaum of Springfield, an attorney hired by Elizabeth Bernoski in the civil case, spoke at length about the proceedings with Court TV's crime library. If the criminal trial had ended in a conviction, it's unlikely the family would have pursued the civil case, Javerbaum said. They were shocked by the outcome. It was an injustice. It was like the OJ case. We couldn't let it end. More than ever, we needed to go ahead with the civil case. Not only did Elizabeth Bernoski lose her husband, she was cheated out of justice. It was important to the family to brand this guy as a murderer. During opening hearings, Zorinsky's attorney in the civil case, Henry First of West Orange, followed Benedict's lead in the criminal case and argued that the Bernoski family failed to file the complaint within the required time period. He too asked that the case be dismissed, citing that the statute of limitations had expired. Javerbaum countered that his client didn't know the identity of her husband's alleged killers for 40 years, therefore the delay in filing. Union County Assignment Judge Edward W. Beglin Jr. allowed the civil suit to continue, and a three-judge appellate panel in Trenton shot down Zorinsky's appeal. First then went to the Supreme Court of New Jersey, asking for a motion to dismiss. They refused to hear the case. Zorinsky, meanwhile, went after Peter Sapsa. According to the Spectator leader, Zerinsky sent a letter to Union County Prosecutor Thomas Manahan claiming he was a victim of 21 separate identity theft crimes from April 1998 to April 1999. Quoting from the letter, 
Zerinsky claimed, Mr. Sapsa's guilty plea in federal court does not relieve him of responsibility for the state law crimes he committed in Rahway. He demanded that Manahan prosecute Sapsa. Three weeks later, Zerinsky sent a letter to State Attorney General John Farmer Jr., which the Spectator Leader published. Zerinsky wrote, I'm bringing the crimes against me to your attention, as I strongly fear Manahan may try to cover up this matter solely because I was acquitted by a Union County jury May 25th of an alleged murder. I'm respectfully requesting your assistance as Attorney General to make an inquiry into the matter of the crimes committed against me and, if necessary, to supersede the Union County Prosecutor's Office in the prosecution of these crimes. The matter went no further. Zorinsky had other problems. First asked for permission to be removed as defense counsel. He contended that Zerinsky owed him money for legal fees and printing expenses. First it handled Zerinsky's estate after his mother's death, and there had been several disagreements along the way. Zerinsky said he had paid first in full, but had lost confidence in him. Zerinsky was given 60 days to find a new attorney. There were several adjournments. Zerinsky kept pleading, I need more time, I need more time, said Javerbaum. He said, I wrote to this lawyer, I wrote to that lawyer. No one will come down here to see me. I have money to pay them, but I can't get anyone to represent me. The judge finally had enough. He said, this case is going to trial. Zerinsky would act as his own attorney. The trial opened in front of Superior Court Judge Thomas Lyons. Javerbaum delivered an opening statement that was purposefully understated. I wanted to be credible, Javerbaum said. I laid out an interesting story, the unique circumstances of the case. I didn't want the jury to think I was bullying Zerinsky. Zerinsky picked up his now familiar battle cry. According to the Star Ledger, Zerinsky said his mother Veronica, father Julius, and girlfriend Carolyn could have corroborated his story that he spent November 28, 1958, the night of the shooting, at the movies. But all his witnesses were now dead. He chose to attack Javerbaum instead. You've just heard Mr. Javerbaum talk, Zerinsky said. I'm not a lawyer. I can't talk like Mr. Javerbaum. He's widely known as the F. Lee Bailey of Union County. Some people call him F. Lee Javerbaum. Said Javerbaum, I turned to the guys I knew from the prosecutor's office and I was like, give me a break. He tried to paint himself as this poor, unarmed guy. Javerbaum put Elizabeth Bernoski on the stand and asked the jury to picture what she'd gone through after her husband was killed. She and her six children moved back in with her parents. She went back to school and got a nursing degree. She helped put each of her children through college. Javerbaum called her the most unpretentious woman you'll ever meet. Zerinsky's tense but brief cross-examination involved the affidavit she gave to Javerbaum and the number of possible suspects the police said had been at the scene, two, maybe three. The drama rose. Judith Sapsa entered the courtroom in a wheelchair, pushed by her husband, Peter. Brother and sister would finally face off against each other, one-on-one. Zerinsky started off the questioning. Isn't it true Mummy always liked me more than she liked you? It was like watching two children, said Javerbaum. Schiffer was next on the stand. He'd been released from Lackawanna County Jail in Scranton, Pennsylvania, after having served more than three years and had received an additional five years probation and 300 days of community service. The Bernoski family had lost an appeal to keep Schiffer behind bars. Schiffer was now this meek old guy, said Javerbaum. It was clear he was not a leader. He was the kind of guy who'd be happy with a beer and a Slim Jim. Zerinsky called Schiffer a liar and said that he'd made a deal with the devil. Zerinsky's theory, which he explained in minute detail, was that Schiffer had been the one who committed the robbery along with two known burglars from Union County, Steve Cobe and Lenny Marr. But for a guy who'd been in jail as long as Zerinsky, and who was charged with a crime that had taken place in 1958, it didn't seem possible that he could reconstruct a particular night from that long ago, said Javerbaum. He, Zerinsky, didn't come off as particularly credible, and the longer he cross-examined Schiffer, the more he hurt his case. He probably had read some book about cross-examination, but it was kind of like having read a sex manual without ever having had sex. He understood the process, but he didn't have the experience. He couldn't separate what was important from what was not important, Javerbaum said. No matter how good a jailhouse lawyer he was, 
A trial case is something else. Zorinsky then put himself on the stand. He referenced his dialogue in both a question and an answer. Question. Mr. Zorinsky, did you murder Officer Bernowski? Answer. Absolutely not. And on and on for an entire day. Javerbaum said Zorinsky overstated his case. It got to the point that I think he actually believed the things he was trying to advance. He convinced himself that the facts were other than what they really were. The jury rendered their verdict in under two hours. Zelinsky was found guilty, and Elizabeth Bernowski was awarded $9.5 million. I cried, said Javerbaum. The old adage proved true. He who defends himself has a fool for a client. Javerbaum never expected Elizabeth Bernowski to receive the full $9.5 million. But six months after the case had ended, Zorinsky had still not made even an initial payment. Zorinsky was devastated, said Javerbaum. He still harbored illusions of a life outside prison. That's why he made such a big deal about his money being stolen from his trust. That was the money he was going to use to start his new life. So it was back again before Superior Court Judge Thomas Lyons. He, Zorinsky, refused to turn over the details of his assets, said Javerbaum. But using the help of investigators, we found $154,000 in a T. Rowe Price Fund in Baltimore, Maryland. He didn't have any friends or family left who could secrete away an account for him. Judge Lyons demanded that Zorinsky turn the money over to Elizabeth Bernowski, plus reveal any inside information remaining on the rest of his accounts. I was then able to prosecute him to the maximum extent I could, said Javerbaum. I even levied the money he had in his account in jail, $70. The Bernowskis would receive approximately $300,000. Zorinsky's appeal in the civil case is still pending. Then that will be the end of it, said Javerbaum. Guzzi is not one to agree. Don't forget Zorinsky is still the first person to be convicted of murder without a body, said Guzzi. As long as Rosemary Calendriello's body is still out there, the Zorinsky tale has not ended. Guzzi paid a final jailhouse visit to Zorinsky in 1987. It was my last day on the force, and I wanted to find out where Rosemary was before I retired, said Guzzi. But Zorinsky refused to see me. A few years later, Guzzi received a letter from Zorinsky, who wished Guzzi well and hoped he was in good health. It's been 25 years since 1969, Zorinsky wrote and I was hoping the old adversarial roles we had a quarter of a century ago might now be discarded and replaced by mutual friendship in the future. He went on to speak of poor health, regretting his crimes, and wanting to die at home rather than in prison. He wrote that he wanted to now work on the side of the law and asked Guzzi to help him get a supervised release from prison. He also asked for Guzzi's home phone number and permission to call him collect. I replied, no thank you, said Guzzi. He never said one thing about Rosemary, or whether he was going to bring me to Rosemary. Not one thing. The only thing he was worried about was getting his ass out of jail. To this day, Guzzi still hopes to find out where Rosemary's buried. Jakubiak sympathizes with Guzzi, whom he credits for keeping interest in Zorinsky alive after his initial acquittal in the early 70s. I really thought we were going to recover her body during the Bernowski investigation, said Jakubiak. I could not understand why he wouldn't give us Rosemary. My whole selling point to him was, look, you're convicted, so you can't be retried. But the bottom line with Zorinsky, and this is my opinion, Zorinsky thinks with her body, he still has a good chance of getting out of jail tomorrow. Pfeiffer offers a different theory. Do you know why Zorinsky never gave up her body? Said Pfeiffer. And I can't prove this, but I think the reason why is you'd find other bodies there. Why else would he keep this secret for so long? Zorinsky has been eligible for parole two times, in 1988 and 1991, but was spurned by the New Jersey State Parole Board on each occasion. The parole board wanted him to admit his role in the Calendriello killing and to show some remorse, said Benedict, referring to the latter hearing. That's when he changed his story and said that he had accidentally run Rosemary over. Jakubiak heard the story as well, directly from Zorinsky. He said he took her to a lover's lane someplace in the highlands. He bought her some kind of brandy. She got really drunk and got out of the car to go to the bathroom and he backed up over her. That's his story. Then he sticks her in the trunk and he doesn't know what to do with her. He starts driving around. 
The parole board ordered Zerinsky to begin psychiatric care, but he declined. No further hearings have been scheduled. Most people involved with the case believe that Zerinsky will never see the light of day, but Pfeiffer, for one, is not quite so sure. He got a 98-year sentence, but you don't serve the full 98 years, said Pfeiffer. He's a model prisoner from what I hear, so there's always the possibility that he could be paroled. It all boils down to the question of where Rosemary Calendriello's body is. Benedict counters with a story about the tape, which he told to Court TV. His wife stayed with him for two years. She ultimately decided to move on and asked him for a divorce. She taped the conversation with him. The parole board has a copy. It starts with him talking about how great she's been, how she's the one steady thing in his life, that he loves her, and that he doesn't want her to leave him. But she's very firm. When he finally realizes that the sweet talk isn't working, it's like he becomes a different person. He makes threats on that tape. Like when he gets out, he'll crush her head like a grape. Some comments about knowing people in the facility who would cap her in a garage somewhere for a carton of cigarettes. But his voice, it's... it's chilling. It's beyond chilling. When I heard it, I said, This is scary stuff. Can you imagine a parole board letting this guy out? When you listen to that tape, you realize he's two different people. On March 11, 2008, a grand jury returned an indictment against Zerinsky for the 1968 murder of 13-year-old Jane Derura based on DNA evidence. Derua went missing on the evening of November 4, 1968, and her body was found the next morning in a field in Middleton, New Jersey. But on November 28, 1968, before he could stand trial for the Derua murder, Zerinsky died at the Southwood State Prison in Bridgeton, New Jersey, of pulmonary fibrosis a scarring of the lung tissue that made it increasingly difficult for him to breathe. 